Hello, and welcome to this series on the present-day ecumenical and interfaith movements. The scriptures tell us that in the last days there is going to be a one-world government and a one-world religious system. Everyone is going to be under the leadership of the Antichrist and the false prophet. They will all be required, all the inhabitants of the earth will be required to worship the Antichrist. All of the world's religions are going to come together and unite together under one umbrella, if I can phrase it that way, one common cause, and that will be to worship the Antichrist. The world religious system today is developing. The ecumenical movement today that is happening today is the foundation to fulfill this prophecy of what is going to be taking place place through the ecumenical and interfaith movements the world is going to be is is being conditioned to think as one religiously as one to put aside our differences our theological or doctrinal differences and let's unite together under one banner the purpose of this series is twofold one to show you that this movement is happening today uh, it's already in progress. Now, we're not going to be doing a thorough study of this, an exhaustive study. Uh, there's just a wealth of information out there. Uh, I encourage you to go on the Internet and look at what is happening. The events change almost daily, so it's something you want to be aware of and, and keep track of. But I'm, trying, I'm putting this together to give you a heads up. If you're not aware of it or you're not really that in tune with it, it's kind of a, it's certainly a warning, but it's a heads up to say, hey, pay attention. This is going on. These things are happening. And the second reason, pay attention. This is happening and it's not of God. This is not God that is behind this, that it has God's blessing upon it. Now, it's in Scripture that it's going to happen because you're going to have the one world church. But it's not of God in the sense that this is something God is ordaining and has his hand of blessing upon it. It is not of God at all. It is a deception of Satan. And it is there to fulfill the end time prophecies of the one world church that will, that will worship the Antichrist. So as we begin to look at this ecumenical movement and the interfaith movement, let's start with some definitions to make sure that we all understand things uh, correctly and we're looking at it the same way. The word ecumenical comes from the Greek and it means the inhabited wor world or all of the inhabitants of the world. Webster defines it as any activity that encompasses the world or involves the inhabitants of the world. So you're looking at a global perspective here when you talk about anything being ecumenical. Now, secondly, you have the ecumenical movement. Webster defines the ecumenical movement as a planned bringing together of all Christians into visible unity. So you're looking at the world, but it's getting narrowed down that you're more specifically looking at Christians, people who claim to be Christians. That's what the primary focus of the ecumenical movement is, of taking all of the people throughout the world, a global initiative that claim to be Christians, and let's unite them together. Then you have the interfaith movement, which is the same thing, except it gets expanded to include people of all faiths whether you're Jewish, whether you're Muslim, whether you're a Buddhist, a Shinto, whatever it might be, whatever religious system that there is uh, in the world, even some would include atheists because they have their own belief system. It may not be in a god or a deity, but they have their own belief system. So it broadens it. Uh, the interfaith movement would include Christians, but it's not restricted primarily to Christians. So. Where does, where does the Word of God say that these things are going to be happening? Let's look at a couple of verses. And again, this is not going to be a, a study of the end times. It's going to be looking at the ecumenical movement per se, but I want to give you some scriptural foundation of why this is together and where it is going. Revelation 13, verse 1. Revelation 13, 1, talking about there will be a one-world government. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his, head, on his heads a blasphemous name. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. 
and listen, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Revelation 13, verse 7, It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So he's going to be fighting the true children of God. And authority was given him over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. So the Antichrist is going to have authority over every tribe, every tongue, every nation, in essence, all the people of the world. Now there's also the one world religious system. Revelation 13, verses 4 and 8. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? All who dwell on the earth will worship him. See, there's your one world religious system. They're all worshiping the beast, the Antichrist. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. That's a key point to have there. Everyone who's in the world who is not a true born-again believer in Jesus Christ, those would be the people that have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. So the scripture here in Revelation is saying, if your name's not written in the Lamb book of, Lamb's book of life, which means you're not a true Christian, all of those people are going to be worshiping the false prophet, the false uh, beast, the, the Antichrist himself. So, and, and this is happening because the Antichrist knows, Satan knows, the Antichrist knows, that in order to rule the earth, you don't just simply bring together all the governments, all the political elements. You have to gather together the religious elements as well. Because as we see even in the world today, because of different religious beliefs, how much fighting and warring is going on, how many divisions are there. So you don't bring people together just politically. You have to bring them together spiritually. So Satan's long-term goal, his long-term process even, is to get all of the people of the world to set aside or to minimize, to reduce their different theological or doctrinal beliefs and to rise up to the top the idea of let's all be one. Let's all get ourselves united. So what have we seen so far? Quickly a recap, there's going to be a one world government. There is going to be a one world religious system ruled by Antichrist and the false prophet and both will be ruled by Satan. Now. What are the foundations of these things that are already set in place today? What exists today that's going to help this all become a reality? Well, some of the world government situations that we have, we're already aware of them. The World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the International Telecommunications Union, the World Customs Organization, and one that we all know of, the United Nations. All of these organizations, and there's more, have in place and give the mindset of we are a global community. We hear a lot of, about that today, you know, the global initiatives. We all have to start coming together as one on the planet and uniting ourselves in our thinking. What are some of the global or worldwide religious institutions already in place? You have the National Council of Churches. You have the World Council of Churches. The United Religions Initiative. The International Council of Religious Leaders. The Tony Blair Faith Foundation. The Council for Parliament of the World's Religions. The Interfaith Center. And the Temple of Understanding. And again, this is just to name a few. There are others. So we can see these things already exist. They're going to be growing. They're going to be strengthening. They're going to be pushing more for the ecumenical uniting of all religious beliefs. Listen to this quote by Robert Mueller. Robert Mueller was the former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. The former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. He said, listen, we have brought the world together as far as we can politically. To bring about a true world government, the world must be brought together spiritually. Listen, we need, what we need is a united 
nations of religions. That's mind-boggling. That is eye-opening. That is like, what? What is he saying here? That's what the ecumenical and interfaith movements are moving towards. They may not use that title, but the idea, the design of the United Nations of Religions. You think of the United Nations today, you have all of these nations throughout the world. So many of them coming together. They maintain their individual distinctives as a nation, but they also unite together and look for the common good. And where is it that we can agree? What are the things that we can agree upon? That's what your ecumenical is, is movement is trying to do. Let's not abolish all of your individual doctrines. Let's, we're not going to abolish your, your theological differences. We know that's not possible. We know that's not going to happen. But how can we come together, make those other things not as important? You can, you can keep them for yourself, but you know how do we, how do we minimize those? and bring to the surface and look at and emphasize what unites us and brings us together as one. So Mueller understood that in order to get the world together, to have a one world government, you had to have a one world religious system. And that's what's in place today. He knew that this needed to become an, a reality. So now, what do we have today and who do we have today that's working towards this, this ecumenical movement ecumenical again movement involving primarily Christians and then the interfaith movement involving Christians and all of the other religious beliefs of the world. Well let me list a few. Number one you have the uh, Roman Catholicism. They made declarations I think it was back in 65 or so talking about an ecumenical movement and how we need to all start to embrace each other and come together as one. Again the emphasis there uh, as far as Christianity is concerned, is that everyone would come back to the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church believes and still believes today that they are the one true church. And so everything that is uh, Protestant, the Protestants, the Protestant Reformation, uh, is, are people who broke away in their opinion, who broke away from the Catholic Church, and now we need to come back. You need to come back to Mother Church. That's how Roman Catholicism looks at it, because uh, you need to come back to us because we are really the one only true church. So the Catholic Church has been working towards that. Certainly Pope Francis has been working hard towards accomplishing that. You have the Lutherans, the Lutherans and the Methodists. They're working very hard towards the ecumenical movements. We'll look at a little bit later on. We'll look more specifically at what the Catholic Church is doing and what the Lutherans and the Methodists have done. They're all in the process and they have signed these uh, documents of agreement of where we, we agree to, we have our distinctives, but we also find common ground where we can unite together and come together. Now you have recently the charismatic Pentecostals are getting on board with the, with the uh, ecumenical movement. You had recently this year, and we will look at this in detail in uh, later lessons, of how uh, Kenneth Copeland had his pastor's conference the beginning of, uh, I don't know if it was in 2014, it might have been a couple of years ago, but he had a pastor's conference where, uh, judging from the audience, there was you know, over a thousand people there. Uh, and again, these are all spiritual leaders from, from around the country, Charismatics and Pentecostals. And uh, he had a, an Anglican bishop that addressed the congregation. And then there was a specific message that was given to that congregation of pastors by Pope Francis, talking about how we need to all come back together again and be united as one. Uh, we're going to look at that in detail. We'll break that down for you. But that shows you where now we have the Catholics looking towards the ecumenical unity. We have the uh, Lutherans. We have the Methodists. And now we have, I'm not saying all Charismatics or all Pentecostals, but there's certainly a large group starting to get on board. Joel Osteen, he's very much in favor of what the Pope is doing and coming together. And in his words, he's, for, he's all for things that are inclusive and doesn't separate and doesn't divide. He wants everybody to be happy under one umbrella. Uh, and I mentioned Joel Osteen. Uh, he's one individual. Um, I mentioned Kenneth Copeland because he had so many pastors there. 
uh, and the influence that's there, but the influence of of Kenneth of uh, Joel Osteen also between his, his congregation, his television ministry, all of the books uh, that he writes, the people that he affect. I, I I read a statistic the other day that uh, between TBN and all of the broadcasts that are on TBN and Joel Osteen with the countries and his influence, that together they reach over seven hundred million people. That's a lot of people. 700 million people. So you have Joel Osteen on board. And again, I, I put these in because of the amount of people that they reach. Rick Warren. How many people does Rick Warren? Uh, he, some people have labeled him America's pastor. He gave a, a prayer at uh, President Obama's <clears throat> inauguration. Uh, he's had a great influence with the Purpose Driven Church, Purpose Driven Life. He is a very, very strong proponent uh, of the ecumenical movement. He's in favor of Roman Catholicism and the Pope. In fact, one video I watched of him the other day, he referred to the Pope as our Pope. Now he's speaking as an evangelical and he's calling Pope Francis our Pope. What does that mean? What does that tell you about his thinking and what he's doing? He's very big on, on these world outreaches and let's set aside, let's put aside, let's minimize our doctrinal distinctives and let's unite together for the common cause. He's not saying forget your do doctrinal distinctives, the wrong, get rid of them. He's just saying this is more important. There's your ecumenical movement. There's where Satan is, is smart, if I can use that term, where he's using his head because he knows he'll never get everybody to forget their doctrinal s distinctives. That's not going to happen. They'll die for them. But if they can minimize them, I'm repeating myself, but this is key. If they can minimize them and get together under one common umbrella, we've accomplished our objective. The seeker-sensitive churches are doing that. Because what, what you're also going to see here, you see it with the seeker-sensitive churches, uh, the emerging church, this type of uh, church organization, uh, and it's very much a part of the ecumenical movement, is that there's a big de-emphasis on doctrine. Doctrine is no longer important. There's where you get back to the influence of TBN. When you had uh, Paul Crouch, uh, I remember listening to one video of him where he didn't want to talk about doctrine, he didn't want to deal with doctrine, doctrine is divisive, doctrine breaks up unity. He actually literally called it doctrinal doo-doo. I want nothing to do with this doctrinal doo-doo. Can you imagine making such a statement? Calling doctrine that, describing doctrine as, as refuse? Because that's exactly what he meant. It's, it's just, it's unbelievable. But you, but you see, they want, because they look at it as doctrine divides, doctrine separates. We're going to talk about that. But you see this, Joel Osteen is another one of those. That, you know, I'm not going to deal with doctrine. I'm not going to deal with theology. I'm all about uniting people and bringing people together. And I'm not about condemning. And I'm not talking about sin. And I'm not, there's all of this happy and peppy and, and you know, bursting with love kind of thing. And can't we just all get together? Well, there's your secret sensitive stuff. We're not going to get into big doctrine and things that divide and just what's all going to make you happy? Your emerging church. That's an attack on the authority of Scripture. It's an attack on the Word of God, and it's an attack on truth. Because one of the big things with the emerging church is, what is truth? Whose truth? Your truth is not necessarily my truth. And my truth may be true, but it's not your truth. And their truth, and their truth, and that. And you go to that country, or that nation, or that culture, or a different cult, this or that. They all have their own truths, and they're all true. They may not agree, but they're all true. So what really is truth? It's a big fight to get away from this is truth. This is the Word of God. You take it up, you open it up, you read it, and boom, 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 boom. Here's what the Word of God says. And this is it. There's no right, there's no left, there's no up, there's no down, there's no maybe, there's no this, there's that. You open it up, you read it, thus saith the Lord. You properly understand what God is saying, and that is truth. There it is. There's the Word of God. That's truth. Uh-uh. Not in the ecumenical movement. See, that's being dogmatic. And when you're dogmatic, you're bigoted. Who are you to say your truth is everybody's truth? Who are you to stand on this? And when you start saying this is my truth and this is the only thing that is true, well, that's divisive. That's bigoted. That's arrogant. We don't want to get into that stuff. We don't want to get into anything that divides. We want unity. We want oneness. You have your social gospel. 
How many churches today, they're more interested in civil rights? Not that, that any of that is wrong. Poverty, feeding the, feeding the hungry, uh, clothing. That, and those things are all scriptural. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing that. But what they do is it happens that that becomes their primary emphasis, especially the civil rights end of it. How many pastors, and if you look at a, a Jesse Jackson or a, an Al Sharpton, they're two of the biggest ones in the news. Uh, they're both called ministers and reverends. Uh, but what are they? They're not out there really evangelizing and preaching so that people come to know the true gospel of Jesus Christ and come to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. I'm not saying they never do that. I don't, I don't they know that they do. I've never heard of it, but I can't say that they don't. But what is their primary emphasis? It's, it's social justice. It's civil liberties. It's how are, how are people being treated. Okay, so there's, there's your ecumenical movement. There's just a little capsule of what's going on today. In the interfaith movement, this is being led primarily by the Pope. Uh, you know, he's, he's recognized world over as the, as the world would recognize him as the leader of all Christians. Uh, that's how the world sees him. So maybe he's a logical focal point. And again, he's trying to get people to come back under the umbrella of Roman Catholicism, which I'm not going to get into it here. But I personally believe when you study uh, scriptures and the end times of what it's going to be, that your one world government is going to be centered in Rome. It's going to be there. That's, that's just a challenge for you to go out and study the scriptures a little bit. If I get on that tangent, that'll make four more uh, videos. So, but Rome is going to be the focal point. The Pope is certainly the focal point. And he's out there right now. I, I mean, present day, he's meeting with Jewish leaders. He's meeting with the Muslims, with the Buddhists, with the Hindus, things that were n never heard of before, and many other of the various different religious beliefs. And he's trying to get them to all unite. And he's saying, look, let's just put aside our differences and <clears throat> let's come together. Right now, it's let's come together and pray. And he's visited a lot of them, got to see a lot of them, and then he invites them to come back to Rome. And they meet at the Basilica or whatever it might be, and they unite themselves together in prayer. So again, all of this is happening right now today. So what is the goal of the ecumenical movement? If I could sum it up in a couple of points, one is let's set aside our theological or our doctrinal differences and let's come together in unity. Let's unite together under one common cause. Now, what do the ecumenical people in the ecumenical movement use as a scriptural justification? Well, they use the prayer of Jesus. Jesus was praying and talking to his Father, and he was praying concerning all true believers in Jesus Christ, all true Christians. And this is what he prayed. It's found in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 22. Gospel of John chapter 17, verses 20 through 22. And he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, listen, that they may be one just as we are one. Now they're saying, look, the Lord Jesus Christ prayed for all of us Christians to be united as one. So that's what we're seeking to fulfill. See, they make it very spiritual. They make it very, try to make it very scriptural. And it is scriptural for all true believers in Jesus Christ, for all Christians to be united together as one. I'm not, when I'm, when I'm saying I'm against the ecumenical movement, I'm not saying I'm against unity. I'm not saying Christians shouldn't be one. That's not what the problem is. The problem is, is who's a Christian? When you say Christian, who are you talking about? Who do you mean? That's where the problem comes. That's where the deception comes. The idea that all true believers should be united in one and we should show the world that we're one, that's scriptural. That's good. That's exactly what Jesus was praying for. That's what should be happening. But in the ecumenical movement, they have a very, very, very different definition of who and what a Christian is. That's where the problem is. And where they pretty much stand right now is they say, if you say that you believe in Jesus, then you're a Christian. 
If you say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, then you are a Christian, then you are my brother, and you are my sister. And if we're all Christians, if you believe in Jesus and I believe in Jesus, then we should all be able to look past our doctrinal theological differences and we should be united together as one. So what's their standard that they have set up? Let me give it to you quickly. There's like, I've, I've made it into eight points. Uh, what the standard is, the ecumenical standard, is we're all united together if we all say that we're Christians. One, set aside the theological differences. Just set them aside and let's unite under one banner. Two, let's respect each other's beliefs. We're not going to be fighting here. We're not going to be arguing. We don't want to divide. So we're just going to, you have your individual doctrines and theologies, but we believe in Jesus. That's enough. We're going to respect each other. Everyone's religious belief is equally valid. They all have truth in them. Yours is valid. Mine is valid. They may not agree, but one's not better than the other. We're all, because you know why? We're all seeking the same God. We all believe in the same God. We only do it in different ways. There's different manners. All roads lead to Rome. You're just on a different road than I am, but when we get to the end of the road, we'll be in the same place. That's kind of the thinking there. So, four, we validate everyone. Everyone's religious belief is valid if you're believing in Jesus, and so therefore we eliminate the conflict. There's no grounds for us to conflict. To conflict. <clears throat> Number five, all religions are welcome as they all carry the same fundamental truths. You see, they're all kind of tied together. They're all saying the same thing in a different manner, but everyone is welcome. We're not going to exclude anyone because we're all carrying the same truths. And if, you're, if you don't believe that that's the case, well, now you've become a bigot. That's bigotry. That's dogmatism. We talked about just, that just a minute ago. If you start saying, it, oh, it's just your beliefs, well, come on. You're not being reasonable. You're not being sensitive to other people. You're being dogmatic. You're being bigoted by just saying your way is the only way. I mean, come on. You know, what, where, what in the world is that? Exclusive claims to truth. That would be number six. Exclusive claims to truth or to salvation are forbidden. They're taboo. You don't do it. Because now you're saying you're right and I'm wrong. And we don't want to go there. We're looking to unite, not to divide. Number seven. All religions are but diverse paths to the same God. I said that before with the all roads lead to Rome. They're all basically the same. We're all going in the same direction. So now number eight, unity becomes the benchmark. Unity becomes the standard. Unity becomes the ultimate goal. That's the focus point, unity. Not doctrine, not theology. It's unity. Buddha, Jesus Christ, Muhammad. Wow. What's really the difference? They're all pointing us towards God. They're all divine manifestations of something. Ultimately, they all express the same teachings. We're going to take some of this and break it down as we go on with this to show you how that is not a scriptural belief. These are not scriptural teachings. So their overall thing is that, you know what, all of our messages, they're not really that different. They're not really that different. So we can set aside our theological differences. We can set aside our doctrine. I keep saying, I probably said it 10 times, but that's the foundation of what's going on here. We're all basically saying the same thing. We're going for the same thing. It's just we got a different way of getting there. Let's move that aside. And let's all come together and unite as one for the common good. There's your ecumenical movement. There's the goal of it. Now. How do you accomplish that? How do you get people to start to think that way? You can, you can put the steps out there. You can put the thoughts out there. How do you get people to accept that? How do you get people to buy into it and say, okay, not only that's reasonable, I can see how I can do that. That's what we're going to look at next in our next lesson. So again, uh, I don't know how many um, series there's, or lessons there's going to be in this series. Uh, I haven't gone all the way through it. But it certainly builds, one builds upon another. So uh, I hope and I'm, and I'm asking that you continue to go through this series so that you get the full picture of what we're talking about here with the ecumenical movement. 
So on our next lesson, we're going to look at how, what things that they put in process so people can get on board. Thank you for watching. May the Lord bless you.